Welcome everyone to um, what should be a really interesting and thought-provoking uh, webinar integrating uh, health and social care. Um, I'm Ewan King. I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer at the Social Care Institute for Excellence and I'm really pleased to be joined uh, by Sam Schwab who is uh, from NHS England and we're going to be talking to you today about a new resource that NHS England has produced with national and local partners which tries to help commissioners, uh, pr practitioners and local people involved in, in improving health and social care and, and making sure that care is responsive to the needs of local people. Um, he's going to talk about that resource and, um, and how it can be used to support better uh, practice on the ground. Um, before we do that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some work that Sky is doing for the Department of Health and Social Care, um, some tools that we think will be, will, will be useful. So there's our photos um, uh, up on the screen. Um, I, think uh, I've, I think I've gained a few more grey hairs. A few more grey hairs uh, gained by both of us. Um, so uh, what, I, what I would like to do now is set the scene a little bit and talk about, as I said, these, these products that we think are going to be very useful for people involved in planning, commissioning and delivering integrated uh, care. Um, and then, um, then I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's going to talk about the Integrating Better resource. And we're really excited to have some inputs um, from our colleagues in Somerset uh, and Leeds, who are going to talk about some of their local practice and how they've been doing this for real in their local communities. Um, so first of all, um, um, my uh, slides. Um, just to set the scene a little bit here, um, uh, since I've been working on integrated care, I believe there's now been uh, one uh, green paper on social care. Another one is promised shortly. We've had the five-year forward view. We've had the pioneers. We've had Better Care Fund. Um, we've had um, very recently the, the long-term plan. And I think some people are asking that question out there. Will, will, will integration really be um, a, a priority this time around? And, and, and genuinely, um, I think, uh, having read the, the long-term plan, that the commitment is there. There's a huge amount of investment going into new structures and ways of, of bringing organizations together. But more importantly, we're seeing a strong emphasis on person, emphasis on person-centered care, on social prescribing, on person-centered care planning, on integrated uh, personal budgets. And all of those elements, I think, can, can really make a difference. So I'm, I'm reasonably um, uh, hopeful. Uh, what remains are uh, huge and significant challenges. I'm just going to highlight um, a, a few of those, um, um, and they relate to these resources um, that, that Sky has been developing. I mean, firstly, um, the systems that you work in are subject to a vast range of, of complex policy drivers and changes, and that is going to get even more uh, challenging um, as demand increases and money um, uh, remains inevitably in short supply. So that begs the question, what should our priorities be? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we're doing with the LGA to try and help local areas think about those priorities. We're also having this issue of um, trying to understand in all this complexity uh, what good integrated care looks, looks like. What factors are most likely to support integrated care? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've done on that as well. Um, there's lots of interventions and, and changes that have been tried and, uh, and tested, but with varying uh, success. So what do we know about what works? And I think we've got a, a clearer sense emerging about what works in integrating care, and I'm going to share some views on that. And finally, if we're moving towards this clear vision of an integrated health and care system, how do we measure our progress in relation to that? So I'm going to very briefly talk about um, four things that I've been working on. Uh, first of all, some of you might have come across our logic model for integrated care. And this helps local areas understand what good integrated care looks like, what are the components that inform uh, good integrated care, and ultimately, how do we, how do we measure it? Um, the second issue is that, that, that uh, balanced dashboard of measures that helps local areas really assess where they're going on integrated care. Thirdly, we're developing right now, and we had a workshop in Leeds yesterday with, with many of your colleagues, I'm sure, on um, what we're developing, uh, which is a high impact actions for integrated care based on the best available evidence aimed at helping you prioritize what to focus on. 
and finally bringing this all together in one place, an integrated digital tool which we're going to launch in a few weeks. I'm going to go through these very, very quickly because there's a lot more uh, interesting stuff that, um, that Sam wants to, to talk about. So let me, let me just uh, briefly highlight each of these in turn. So the logic model um, has been endorsed by NHS England, the HSC, and CQC. And it's really a device for helping local areas think about what uh, enables uh, integrated care to take place, what conditions do you need to have in place to have a good integrated care system, and what are the main components based on evidence that can make a real difference to service users, to health and care systems, and to the wider health and care system itself. The model it's, uh, itself was developed through an extensive review of literature and uh, a number of uh, learning, learning from a number of initiatives which I've listed there. And it helped inform a piece of work that we're currently working on for the DHSC, which is on uh, identifying useful measures for the system. This is a logic model. I am not going to attempt to describe every element of it. It's on our website. Please have a look. We'll send around the slides that go with this, uh, this webinar at the end of the session, so you'll have a look at it there. But it describes some enablers that go into an integrated care system, uh, sorry, an integrated system, and it covers things like good governance and systems leadership, uh, interoperable uh, in, uh, information systems that so people can access and share patient records. It then feeds into components of integrated care, such as having really uh, good uh, ways of identifying people at risk, people who need support, um, high-functioning multidisciplinary teams. It talks about having good transfers of care. And those feed through into outcomes for people based on the I statements that uh, National Voices developed that many of you may have come across, and changes for the system and for services. And finally, it feeds through into, into long-term impacts and improvements for the health system. How do you use this model? You'll find out more on our website. It can help inform the, your strategic plans, the way in which you deliver and design services, and how you evaluate your impact. Um, and uh, happy to, to respond to any uh, questions about that uh, if, you, if you email me. We'll provide you with our details at the end of this uh, presentation. Measures um, are a very difficult thing to pin down. How do we actually know we're making progress on integrated care? We've been doing some work with the DHSC and national partners on how we measure integrated care. What we do know is that the measures are not uh, in the right place. There are gaps, particularly around how people experience integrated care, and we're currently advising national government on how we uh, plug those gaps. But what this dashboard shows, this table shows, is the best available national measures, which taken together um, can give you some sense of how you're doing on, on local integration. And again, this is all on our website. Happy to send this through. Finally, uh, we're working with our colleagues uh, at the LGA on building what we're calling high impact actions for integrated care. We think as national partners, we've got a, a good emerging picture of what a, a high performing exemplar integrated system looks like. And as such, we think we can develop a set of high impact actions which draw on the evidence, but more importantly, identify what you actually do based on the evidence to make a difference at a local level. So it's going to be a really practical tool. We're testing it out with a wide range of audiences at the moment, and we're hoping to publish this in May. And this is just a sample of, of how it will work. It will look a lot uh, better than this, a lot flashier than this, but this is, this is the design principles. We've got uh, uh, a set of um, uh, high impact actions, which we've got, um, uh, which were which we've identified, and then we will identify the high impact action. Um, we explain why this action is important, why it can make a difference to in integrated care, and importantly, it will feed through to some specific actions that you should take in order to deliver that high impact action. We will send this around very soon for, for comments, and if anyone's interested in having a look at it, please do, do email me, and we're happy to take feedback on it. It's a live tool, and we hope to publish it in May. And as you can see, it will punch through. You can, you can tip, click through to evidence and tools uh, and supporting case studies. And finally, also uh, in, in, in May now, to be absolutely honest, not in April, um, we will be launching an integrated digital resource, which brings, based on the logic model I described earlier, brings together in one place useful evidence, uh, uh, resources, tools that can help you make a difference on integrated care. 
uh, and all of this will be um, publicized through our website in due course. I'm going to hand over to Sam now, who's going to talk to you about integrating better. Thanks very much, Ewan, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sam Schwab. I'm a senior strategy manager in the strategy team at NHS England. Thanks very much to Sky for, for hosting us today on the webinar, and thanks to everybody for tuning in as well. I've uh, noticed um, in terms of people introducing themselves and where they're from, we've got a really, really great, diverse geography of, uh, of areas tuning in, everyone from Durham to Devon, uh, you know, via Lancashire and Rotherham. I'm sure there's plenty more of you from different places across England there. So thank you again for giving up your time on a Friday afternoon. It's very warm here in London um, and sunny. I hope it is with all you as well and it continues over the weekend. Um, so what, what I'm going to be doing is, is giving a bit of an overview of, of a project that myself and others in NHS England have been leading for about a year now, looking at integration, primarily integration between health and social care services, but, but also wider local authority and, and other community services as well. I'm going to give a bit of an overview of, of why we took any action in the first place, why we did something, then on to kind of what it was that we did, and then a bit of, a bit of time to talk about the outputs and reflections and, and the afterlife of the project, particularly in terms of what NHSE is doing next, and especially around that, those links to the long-term plan that you was talking about before. I think just before we, I, I dive in, I want to say that underlying everything that we did and the way that we went about this, this project was a, a really a spirit of collaboration. Yes, this was an NHS England-led project, but in the in space of integration, everything's built on establishment of good relationships and working in partnership with other organisations. That, that's something through the guide itself that we want to encourage locally, and hopefully we've, we've modelled this behaviour through the way that we've gone around this project. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. I'd just like to open with a poll, if, if that's all right, just to kind of set the context for, for one of the reasons that we understood this project. Um, I'm going to read out the question, and Steve, who's, who's helping us, is going to launch the poll. Um, so you can see it there on the slides. It's just a really simple question, really. What response from these three best describes the status of integration between NHS services, local authority services, and voluntary community sector services in your local area. So there's three options, seamless, hand in hand, willing to work together but room for improvement, or completely separate. So Steve, if you could launch the poll. Thank you. And we'll just give people around kind of 30, 45 seconds to respond. Um, I mean, it's quite a, <laughs> it's quite a well-shaped question. I uh, hope you'll forgive the little bit of nudge work I did to shape it. I can promise that I would steer clear of any shaping of any future referendum questions. And I've already broken Steve's rule of mentioning Brexit, so apologies for that. I promise that'll be the last time. Okay, so results coming in. Just give you guys another sort of 10, 15 seconds or so, if that's all right. Just while those uh, final responses are coming in, there's been a couple of questions that asking around how to access the Integrated Better Guide. Um, Appreciate at the moment it's behind the login, although it doesn't. You don't have to be in the NHS to register for a login. We'll make sure that the guide itself is is made available after to, to um, on this guy web, website after this, and we'll also I'll also send around some instructions for how to access the future NHS platform as well. Okay, so I'm going to call time on the poll. So as I hoped <laughs> in the way that I shaped the question, 90% of respondents say that. Yeah, services in the area and organisations are willing to work together, but there's room for improvement. This result is great, it's what I wanted, because um, it, it demonstrates that whilst there's a lot of willingness there, things aren't working as fantastically as we know they potentially could, and so it justifies that, uh, to some extent why NHS England did something in this space. What I'd like to do, to do now uh, is just go into a bit, bit more detail of, uh, as to why, why what, what some of the decisions were that led us to kind of start working this space. So first of all, though, is the potential of integration. I mean, it's often often been said for many, many years, but it's increasingly being proven that integration of health with social care and other community services has the potential to deliver significant impact in improving outcomes for people and in terms of preventing escalation of need and treatment of individuals in settings where they don't necessarily want to be and shouldn't have to be. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of increasing amounts of evidence out there at the moment, but uh, so, uh, some of the things that I've, I've seen that are worth looking up if you haven't already. Uh, Public Health England have published a return on investment document around joining up, what happens when you join up falls prevention services, uh, and also the evidence of kind of detox rates from the, the 
Vanguard's NHS England did, where there are integrated approaches to hospital di discharge and the effects that it had. And I think you'll see some of that in terms of uh, Stephen uh, and Lynn's um, presentation from Somerset later on. Uh, in addition, the kind of the advantages of, of linking health and care services with wider community services, such as housing or other community services undertaken by the voluntary community sector, are increasingly being shown to support population health and well-being. So that's the kind of the potential of integration. I suppose why why NHS England? Well, obviously, we have a responsibility in relation to setting direction for health services. And even if you aren't convinced by the potential argument, although I'm sure everybody on this webinar is. There's a kind of fundamental day-to-day -day need for NHS and adult social care services to work together as best they can and make the best use of resources. Um, I think there is a particular kind of NHS England perspective on why we want we undertook work in this area. Uh, we've had we had feedback from the initial SDP planning process that in some areas local authorities were not as involved, adult social care services were not as involved as they should have been in setting a vision and strategic plan for improving health and care for people. Um, this is something we wanted to address as an organisation and it was a, another spur for us to take particular action. Finally, in terms of timing, most people are familiar with the increasing budgetary pressures placed, placed by health and care services, particularly in the face of the ageing demographic at the moment. When we set out on this project in kind of late 2017, early 2018, there were also there were two key bits of work that were going to be shaping the future of integration, and, and we wanted to make sure that we could influence them and had the right evidence to hand to be able to do so. One of those, as you mentioned, was, was the green paper, uh, and secondly, obviously, the long-term plan as well. I'm going to say a bit more about each of those later. So. Bringing these issues together, we, we set about an, an aim, a headline aim for the project, uh, and then we undertook a series of engagement at both a local and national level to determine what it would be that we would do. As I said at the beginning, we were keen that this process was as collaborative as possible and one that added value to work already underway. Ewan's talked about a lot of different products that Sky are working on with partners such as ADAS and, and the LGA, and there are people on this slide who are also undertaking uh, development of tools and wanting to support integration. Um, someone's just mentioned that they've been working in the integration agenda for about 10 years uh, and, and, and it is the case that there's been a lot of tools during that time. So we wanted to do something that would, that would add value. Um, we, as well as these national organisations, we, we also spoke with a, with a number of local health and care systems and people within them. This included uh, provider trusts, uh, directors of adult social care and, and public health health and care commissioners, as well as providers too. What we established through this was that there wasn't really an issue in, in terms of encouraging people to understand why they should focus on integration. There was a clear appetite and commitment from pretty much everyone we spoke to in, in favour of it. Uh, and people were kind of signed up to, to do what they could to push this further. Despite these intentions and the range of resources that were already there, areas were facing a, a number of common barriers in turning this theory and, and their desire to move things forward in, turning it into practice. And some of these things were kind of quite big structural issues which we weren't necessarily going to be able to address through the project that we undertook, although we could help feed them into wider discussions uh, with ministers of departments and the long-term plan. But it, for issues that weren't those kind of really big, chunky uh, uh, kind of structural issues, there was almost always some example of some area that we found who would overcome a barrier that was faced by another area. So crucially, uh, what we kind of asked local staff what, what that we engaged with, what they felt would benefit them most, and that was, hopefully you guys will agree, was learning from peers. And those last two points kind of helped us focus on what it was that we should focus on during the project. So we developed a kind of mechanism for where we wanted to get to and what the products were that we wanted to do, and a mechanism for our delivery. Mainly we were going to develop a, a headline app that was going to, we're going to be develop a guide that contains a range of information and resources that would support local areas, focusing on very much on the kind of how-to of integration. Um, we didn't want to kind of set out only principles, we wanted to really focus on kind of detail and practical support of good practice. So having established what it was that we wanted to do, um, which was develop good practice and share it with people, uh, you can't understand good practice unless you work with some good practitioners. Uh, and we had to select a kind of a limited number of people. So to do that, we used the relationships we developed with people such as 
Best Care Fund team and the, Net and the Better Care Managers Network, LGA and Sky and the STP Network to get suggestions from them for local areas of different sizes and scales and location who had undertaken what they felt to be good work in terms of delivering uh, in some aspects of integration. So we held interviews and workshops with reps from these areas and these were predominantly people with kind of in senior strategy roles or, or operational managers or directors as well as people who are undertaking the services themselves and receiving them. And these were these these workshops and interviews were facilitated by both us and the LGA to develop an understanding of what each area was doing, what common elements could be derived for the purposes of being adopted by other areas. We're, we're very grateful uh, to all of the areas who took part. We've got two of them coming on to speak uh, later. Uh, they are pre-recorded though, although I think I've seen Stephen in the chat, so hopefully we can ask some questions of, of him if, if people want to. Um, this, it's worth saying this wasn't a funded ex exercise like the NHS Vanguard, and, and everyone uh, who represented these local areas gave up their time willingly and with the kind of combined aim of, of sharing the knowledge that they gained through their own experience. So I'm going to give a really brief overview of the structure and key elements of the guide and then leave everyone to kind of seek it out and we can hear from the some actual areas who have participated as well themselves. So the amount of information we gathered from 16 sites was, was pretty big. Uh, so we cut it up into themes, which I've just set out here on this slide, um, five main themes where our information and kind of tips would play in. The first of these was around leadership, so I think thinking in a kind of cross-system way about uh, developing a vision and then implementing it and getting buy-in from all the organisations you want to work together, uh, as well as linking it with people who are going to receive those services. Secondly, it's kind of a bit of a bit of an oddball theme, which was around universal approaches. Uh, so this kind of contains some description and examples of, of, of different approaches and principles that underpin services that are integrated across different points in the pathway. So things that are quite common to different to different areas wherever care is being delivered. Um, so, for example, sharing of information between organisations is always something that comes up as as something that's that's really tricky. If you've got different IT systems, it can be a bit of a nightmare. And multidisciplinary team working is another example of that. Then there's uh, the, uh, the themes here which are numbered four, five, and six. All of these kind of focus on a certain setting in which people receive care and services are kind of delivered. Um, and they kind of broadly correspond as well to the way in which the CQC whole system reviews are uh, looked at things, which is an example of, of where we've tried to align with build on what's already out there rather than reinvent, you know, three themes that NHS England thinks are where uh, tips and, 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 and uh, things should be considered, which are not what we wanted to do. So slide nine here just gives a quick overview of how each section within the guide is covered, gives a short definition of what it is we're talking about, goes into the underlying principles, and then in the guide itself we'll go into more detail about each of those principles, what they look like in practice, and support this with examples and other resources. Uh, I think the overwhelm, yeah, one thing from the one part of the guide, which actually probably forms the bulk of it, it's probably about 50 pages or so, uh, is although I want to highlight is the uh, detailed case studies. I mean, the overwhelming feedback we had from local sites about what would be most useful for them to support them on their integration journey was, you know, detailed case studies from other areas. So we tried to cram as much of these in to the guide as possible. Um, sometimes the case studies take form of short kind of vignette type things illustrating a particular approach um, uh, and, and as I said the majority of the guide is actually taken up by these in-depth case studies. Whilst there's a lot of content there, hopefully it doesn't make them boring or over detailed, we've worked with people to put a particular onus on, on honesty. Uh, I mean often when you see kind of short one-page case studies you sometimes are left wondering, well, okay, so it can't have been that easy, or it can't be all rosy. And I think, you know, I myself have worked in um, adult social care uh, and health integration um, in a local authority, and I've seen that, you know, whatever you try and do, there's always barriers that you have to overcome. So we try to encourage the honesty um, to be brought out in this case studies so that people can see how barriers were overcome. And then finally, there's uh, something around the starting point documents, which are kind of, documents from some of our sites that can be used as templates 
uh, as a starting point for you guys uh, in your area to um, you know, take a template and develop it and, and, and make it suitable for your area. We know every area is different, every way in which services need to be integrated in different areas are different, but this just gives you something to, to take if, if it's useful. So we made the guide available in January. And it's part of the STP library of good practice, which is on the Future NHS collaborative platform. We've also worked with our partners to disseminate the guide to our target audience. And it's going to feature in some of the work that Ewan reflected in, uh, from Sky and, and other partners going forward. It's had a really good reception so far from our intended audience. It'd be really interesting to hear the thoughts of those. We know it isn't perfect, um, but it'd be interesting to see if you guys think it hits the spot in terms of adding value. In terms of next steps of embedding the principles and the content that we found, we've worked with existing NHS England work streams like the Personalised Care Group and the STP team to make sure that the things we recommend are reflected in the workshops that they'll be doing to support local areas on their integration journey. Um, although we ourselves are not doing anything that's integrating better kind of related. One of the big successes of the project for me was our ability to use the findings to inform the long-term plan whilst also being a means to support implementation. The evidence we gathered during the project fed into the development of the chapter one, which sets out the types of integrated services that NHS organisations are going to be incentivised and encouraged to work on in, with their local partners. You, know, you can see in there, if you, if you look at chapter one, social prescribing, integrated rapid response type services, and, and generally better joined up community care. Um, and having made the guide available at this point has been really good timing because it provides that practical information on how to for areas as they look to take the next stage in their integration journey. Whilst I, took, I spoke at the beginning about the green paper and the Better Care Fund review, whilst we're still waiting for the outputs of both those, we, as have Sky and, and others, have been closely linked with DHSC and NMH CLG throughout our project and we've fed in our outputs to those. So that, that's the IB guide. I've just got two more slides here from NICE um, and their Quality Matters work, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. I just want to highlight these because we've worked with NICE in particular uh, and I want to demonstrate how in the making of the IB guide and, and where we pitched it, we strive to be as aware of and aligned with other organisations producing material in the space. So the, the Unlocking Capacity to Master Together is an online resource that's designed to encourage uh, people's experience of seamless services by encouraging better collaborative working uh, at a range of levels between health and social care professionals. Their resource is designed to give a headline overview of a single principle and then support this with content to start conversations locally about that will inform collaboration and as a starting point. So we worked with NICE to, to make sure that we were doing different things and I think you can see that here because the IB guide has a, uh, a wider focus, looks at structures and processes as well as relationships. And it's full of ideas for local areas to take forward, but it fits well alongside something like the Quality Master Resource because that takes a deeper dive into a single element and takes a look at it from different angles, explores impacts on individuals themselves, um, and contains questions and materials to help inform group work at a local level. So I know that um, Holly at NICE is keen to hear back from people who've used this as well. So uh, uh, please do get in touch with them as well as with us if you want to know more. Let's move in. So I think we're now going to hear um, from two um, from two people who have been involved in the guide. Um, that is, um, we're going to hear um, uh, an audio clip um, uh, from uh, of Stephen Chandler, who's the director of Adults uh, Services and lead commissioner, Health and Care at Somerset Council, and Lynn Stevens, um, uh, his colleague, who's a strategic manager for Somerset Hospital Interface Services. Um, however, I've been told I've got that in the wrong order, so um, uh, it's been a long week um, and it's been in the show. Um, so actually we're going to hear first from Lindsay Bell, uh, who is Primary Care Commissioning Manager at Leeds uh, CCG. So we're going to hear from, from Lindsay and then and Social then, prescribing and then has been from, around for nearly 30 years, starting right back from those pioneers of community supported care in Bromley by Bow in the 1990s. But it's only really recently, as more areas start implementing social prescribing services and evaluating them that the evidence base has grown 
to show just how much impact an effective service model can have. Social prescribing is an excellent example of how integrating an already impactful service with other community-based care can make significant changes to how health and social care providers work together to help all their citizens improve their physical and mental health. It's also starting to affect how communities come together to help each other. The big success we have found in Leeds is that the more services are linked and integrated with general practice, the more successful they have been. In North Leeds, we originally piloted social prescribing with a small number of practices who demonstrated the impact it could have as part of a wider primary care team. We have seen that link workers have become more successful where they were fully integrated into primary care, not necessarily employed by the practice, but treated as a direct team member, introduced to new staff members, included in team meetings, and part of complex care multidisciplinary discussions. Strong link workers feed back outcomes to referrers and are included in clinical meetings within the practice. This resulted in high levels of satisfaction with the service from practices and a sense of ownership. We started our journey towards a fully integrated accountable care system, beginning with networks of providers built around general practices, working in natural geographical communities. These form local care partnerships. This is being done alongside the realignment and embedding of our adult social care teams and community nursing teams to those same geographical communities. Social prescribing is also a key member of the local care partnerships. Some examples of how social prescribing integrates with local care partnerships include link workers doing joint visits with adult social care colleagues, working with specialised social workers supporting those with sensory impairments, link workers shadowing adult social care and community nursing colleagues to get a better understanding of the issues that service users face. Link workers attend multidisciplinary team meetings and this allows real joint working and monitoring to happen. Social prescribing services accept direct referrals from social care and community teams. Social prescribing focuses on engaging clients with support systems that are available in their community allowing social care and community nursing teams to focus on the client's actual care needs. So what has been the outcome that we've seen here in Leeds? We've witnessed reductions in primary care activity for those accessing support and an assessment from a link worker, not just signposting to community services. Reductions in attended appointments as well as DNAs. As service users are predominantly lower risk, lower intensity users, this reduction then frees up capacity for our GPs to support more complex patients and address unplanned admissions to hospital. We've seen an evidence of reduction in non-elective bed days as service users become more resilient, independent, with better support networks at home and in the community, making discharge from hospital quicker. Our social prescribing services in Leeds use the short Warwick Edinburgh scale to measure improvements in well-being, which look at confidence, self-purpose, ability to think clearly, make decisions and deal with problems. All of our services showed significant improvements in service users' well-being scores. We have very high levels of satisfaction with the service from those so using That was uh, Lindsay Bell, um, Primary Care Commissioning Manager, Leeds. Uh, clinical commissioning group and um, uh, I know from from our work at Sky how, how many impressive things are going on in Leeds. I, I imagine it's a really uh, good place to, to visit to find out more about how to integrate health and social care. We're going to, uh, we, we are going to leave enough time to answer some of your questions so don't worry about that um, uh, but I'd like to move swiftly on to, to um, uh, the recording of Stephen Chandler and Lynn Stevens uh, from Somerset. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to share Somerset's experience of integrating around our detox performance. My colleague Lynn Stevens and I want to share with you the journey we've been on. That's a journey that began two years ago, where we here in Somerset had one of the poorest performing detox performances 
across the country. We wanted to do better, but we just weren't able to find the way to do that. We often spend time blaming each other rather than focusing on positive outcomes. So what did we do? I want to share with you a few of our critical success factors. So firstly, as the system leadership group, we tried to agree what was important. And for us, that had to be developing a strengths-based approach to practice. It was also important that as leaders, we saw the system rather than our own parts of that system. And we took a system-wide approach to everything we did. Success only occurred at a system level. There were no individual successes. Rather, everyone succeeded or none of us succeeded. Alongside that, we had to ensure that our performance improved. And you'll see from some of our slides an impressive and sustained improvement journey. And that's because as well as focusing on strengths based and on practice, we had an absolute focus on performance, daily focus on individual delays, daily focus on the reasons for that. And finally from me, we weren't shy and indeed it's absolutely necessary to continue to repeat the importance of those messages. Why it is we're doing what we're doing, the impact of what we're doing, and celebrate the successes as they occur and address the challenges equally. So hand over now to Lynn to take us through what that's meant from an operational point of view. Lynn. Thank you, Stephen. So from an operational point of view, it has meant a very different way in some ways to how I've had to manage things and manage people. Two joint posts in each part of the county. And being joint posts, was useful because it meant that they were sat across the NHS social care interface and we made a decision that they would be the ultimate decision makers around pathway decisions, which is key because no matter how mature your system is, there will always be disagreements and it's important to know that someone has that final say. But what it means for having a joint post is that that individual then is accountable to a number of people and it's key to ensure that, as for me, the social care manager, I am also aware of what their NHS manager um, is saying to them. So it's about having an awareness of all of those conversations, which is what was different about managing this, because typically you have your managers and you manage them. But in this scenario, you have a manager who then has other managers and you have to work very closely with them. So what that meant for me in reality was much more investment in relationships much more time spent physically face to face talking about and repeating where we were with our messages and what the model would mean i think we um we also focused on the good stories so we've had a lot of success um, as stephen alluded to in performance but also those individual stories that really bring the model to life and it's important to have some of those in your back pocket that you can pull out at key moments when some people might be feeling a little bit lost with the model and it's really good to reinforce that. So I think that brought people forward at times. Um, being able to share the success stories and repeat the successes that you've had is valuable. Um, we, uh, For me, I also chair the implementation meetings that ensures providers, uh, the stakeholders from across the county attend so we can share progress but also talk about challenges. But we've not been shy to have back to basics meetings where we've had to repeat. Okay, so that, that was Lynn and, and Stephen and, um, and also uh, Lindsay uh, a little earlier. And we really um, are very, very grateful for them taking the time out of their hugely uh, busy schedules to, to, to contribute those, those videos. As we said at the start, those videos will be made available with all the slides um, uh, and recording of the webinar once once it's uh, once it's finished. Um, I, I think it's really quite uh, powerful to actually leave that slide up there, the, the the delayed transfers of care performance slide, because in a way we forget um, that the reduction in days that um, uh, of delays in, in bed days that's, that 
that's demonstrated in that slide um, is a reduction in, in human suffering and misery, really, and, and people getting out of hospital earlier, getting the support they need to live uh, more independent lives. It's an incredible uh, contribution that we, we can make, and I think we sometimes forget that. That's the, that's the goal of, of integrating health and, health and social care. Okay, so we've had some, some comments and questions. Um, we have noticed that there's been a few people asking who, who the culprit was who said that everything was seamlessly integrated in their local area. Please do own up, because um, uh, uh, if you are uh, in that position, we'd love to find out more. Um, but on a, uh, on a serious note, there has been other um, uh, interesting uh, questions. Um, we've, we've heard um, people ask us about the role of mental health. Um, have they been included in, in, in this piece of work? Um, we all would accept that they're incredibly important part of the jigsaw, but I don't know, Sam, if there's been any involvement of mental health. So, we, I mean, I think we were aiming with the guide to, to kind of be as, as broad and generic as possible. Um, I, we definitely did uh, consult with people um, who are, you know, heads of mental health services as part of our engagement locally. Um, what, as it, the sites that we selected and, and the services that, that we used from their uh, area ended up being more focused on, I suppose, uh, non mental health adult social care. But in Leeds, in particular, there was an emphasis on, on you know, not categorising necessarily and being condition specific. It, it, was, it was about the principles of the service were about how to work better together. And I think Julia has mentioned there on the guide about it's it's, it's not necessarily about starting from the different organisations at the moment. It's more about treating people in in uh, who live in, in whole communities. Through an asset-based approach, so the guide, the principles in the guide apply to, I think, to mental health um, integration as well. Um, but I do think it's probably one of the flaws that we, we didn't seek out as many kind of distinct mental health things as, as we could have done. And, and on that, I mean, there's also been a question about the involvement of the voluntary sector. Um, one of one of the events that actually Stephen Chandler contributed to um, recently, a BCF event, talked about how how we better engage. Uh, voluntary and community sector in, in decisions about um, about integration. Um, that's also going to be on our website soon, and we'll, and we'll and we'll make sure you have a link to that. It's got his uh, his slides and contributions from organisations like Age UK about how how we do that better. Absolutely, it, it, it's essential. There's a question about um, what the relationship is between this this uh, agenda, this piece of work, and primary care. Network. Works. It's a very good question, um, but I'm going to ask someone else to answer it, which is Sam. So have a go, uh, please, Sam, on that. I'll have a go. I, I, I mean, I think it's been asked to, can we spell, spell out? I mean, it's worth spelling out first what primary care networks are, I think. Uh, I mean, they're kind of things that have been introduced formally in, in the long-term plan about geographies of, I think, between 30,000 and 50,000 people. Um, that's going to be a countrywide uh, structural kind of framework. Uh, from the NHS to kind of coordinate around which integrated services will in part be coordinated. I think particularly around the multidisciplinary team working, I mean, people are seen and engaged with, you know, local authority services, with VCS services, with um, NHS services, but a, one constant for pretty much everybody is their general practitioner. And so the idea, I think, of, of setting up these frameworks and routing uh, place-based care in, in these in, in these geographies is to kind of to try and uh, drive engagement with general practitioners with other health and social care services to to get them make them aware make general practitioners aware of what the plethora of services are out there and to help them be engaged in decision making around what that, around decision making for what those services should look like in the future based on their their knowledge of the population their knowledge of the need that's out there so. All, all of the stuff we put together in, through Integrating Better is, is absolutely applicable uh, in relation to primary care networks. When we were writing the guide, we weren't necessarily aware that that was going to be the delivery zone, but everything we, we've written there is, is, is applicable and can be used as part of, as PCNs kind of take off and work with those other organizations that the guide is more routine. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. There's a question about um, whether there are any national training programs planned around personalised care planning, um, uh, multidisciplinary teams. I, I know that if um, I, if you read the um, uh, uh, one of the elements of the, the long-term plan, the, the personalised, comprehensive personalised care plan, there are clear targets um, that I've seen around 
training uh, people in person light uh, care planning, care and support planning. I've also seen plans to train and develop um, people with lived experience to be more involved in, in decisions at a local level about integrated care. Um, there are plans to develop and train link workers who will be critically, critically involved in, in um, delivering social prescribing. So I think in short, yes, that there, there are uh, ambitious plans that I have seen about training and development, um, but I'm sure that there's more that could be could be done on that area. I don't know, Sam, if you're aware of anything else that will help develop the staff uh, to, to support this kind of work. Um, so I know that there's, uh, there's a, a you know, key underlying thread of long-term plan implementation is around workforce and linking with Health Education England and, and also uh, social care workforce services to try and uh, engage that. It's an NHS-wide problem that's and, and beyond that's been there for, for ages. So yeah, absolutely, workforce is key. On the particular personalised care bit, I can't for the life of me remember the kind of the targets, but um, as, as, as you say, there are some quite ambitious things around developing um, personalised care planning and expanding it as far as possible around the country. So that's within the long-term plan as well, if you, if, and, and in the kind of personalised care publication that came out, I think, in January too. So we can send links to those for, to people to learn more. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's any other questions here. Um, flying past a, a, a considerable uh, rate. Um, one of the questions that someone asked about, um, oh, conversations with communities. Sorry, I got there in the end. Um, so certainly this piece of work involved conversations with the communities um, in the local uh, in the local sites. So so they they've had a role at, at a national level as well, I believe. Yeah. Um, but I think um, there's much more that needs to be done about how you um, involve people with lived experience, carers and families in the wider community in the design, commissioning, delivery and evaluation of of, in, of integrated care services. I mean certainly at Sky we have. Uh, a, a significant commitment. We make a significant commitment to what we call co-production of, of services and our colleagues, Think Local, Act Personal, um, who are based in our building, have a lot of uh, good resources as well on this. So, so do have a look at um, resources on how you build up the local uh, capability skills and, and arrangements to have co-production as a key element of, of integrated care. Um, I think it's a very, very good point that someone's uh, uh, raised. There's a, a question around about the, I think, on, on the on the enablers and the logic model, where is the financial reform? Um, I We can't influence exactly how financial reform works, but what I can say is that the logic model uh, is very clear that people at a local level need to bring together budgets, to pool and align budgets, um, so that we are trying to increasingly have a single approach to budgeting uh, and financial planning within a local area. And I, I know that integrated care systems are experimenting right now with um, open open book accounting systems, having a one a single financial plan for a local area. That's got to be the future. Mm. So eventually we don't get tied up in silo-based approaches to funding. I, I, Do you want I, to come in? Some all I, I agree with all that, I mean, definitely. And, and it's, it's true that you know, STPs and ICSs are, are working that way. Something that we saw during the development of the guide that's, that's, that emerges as kind of a, almost a precursor to that, I suppose, is that people uh, know where they want to go in relation to that, but sometimes the systems don't support it. But in terms of uh, getting people on board with it, there's been uh, this, this there's been this kind of development of the idea of the local pound, um, which a lot of a lot of places kind of start to use and becomes common parlance, so that even before you get to that point where you're structurally in an open book type relationship, that that principle of this is the the Bradford pound or um, the Somerset pound, uh, and that it's all you know it's all public money to imp designed to improve services for people. Um, that has that I've, we've seen that emerge in a number of areas and have, have and gained a lot of traction to then lead to uh, more joined up and jointly funded services. And there's a great suggestion from uh, from Jill Martin, who I think is involved in reablement services. Um, couldn't agree more um, about joint training and joint development. Um, you don't have to say that the research says it, but the research does say that if you bring people together and train them together and develop them together in the same building if possible, um, you do build those the relationships that are necessary to support integrated working. Um, I think we need to do much more at an earlier age and uh, 
earlier stage in the development of, of, of people working in care and support to make sure that they're being trained together. I, I totally agree. Um, okay, we may have... Um, oh, we're hearing about the Totnes. Totnes Pound. Pound. You see, I'm from Edinburgh. I'm not sure. Is that is that down in Devon? Have I got that right? I'm getting nods. That's a good sign. Um, so, okay, we've got time for uh, possibly one or two more questions, and then I'll leave you and let you get on with the rest of your... Uh, afternoons. Any any final questions? I just got. I'm just going to come in on something oh, yes, that was said earlier on in the in the thread actually about um, and, and something that came up again in our development of the guide. It's one of those structural things that really frustrates people in in, in working together better. Is is around uh, sharing of information, just purely IT um, talking to each other. Uh, there are there are places who have who've worked that out. There's always work around. Um, I think. You know, nationally, NHS England and, and improvement have, have woken up to that in a big way. I think we're, we we've set out plans to launch local health and care records and to foster um, new ways of doing that. So there's a lot more to come on that. I think in in, in the near future. So hopefully that will be uh, a real enabler for people. Okay, and what what's really good to see is just that actually a lot of you are just getting on with networking and talking to one one another and sharing examples and resources. That's brilliant. Um, uh, good to see. So um, uh, I don't think there's any further questions, uh, and uh, I think on that uh, note we will we'll wrap up this webinar. Um, we have your details, I believe. Um, just on just final point for me um, in relation to that um, uh, resource that we're developing jointly with the local government association. My email is up on the screen there. I can email you the full draft version, and I would be welcoming comments back on that. So please do just email me, and I'll I will send you the document, and then I would like to love love to see to hear your comments back, and we'll take those on board. Thank you very much. Um, have a good afternoon. Thank you, and it's been great to be on the webinar. And just once again, thank you to all our areas who took part in the guide, and particularly Somerset and Leeds.